on UGTV. A special session of the Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. I'm going to ask the clerk to announce the meeting and call the roll. A special session is being held on Monday, July 17th. Good evening, everyone. We're calling the roll. A special session is being held on Monday, July 17th, 5 o'clock p.m. regarding a budget workshop. Roll call. Mugia? Here. Johnson? Here. Kane? Here. Markley? Here. Walters? Here. Philbrook? Here. Bynum? Here. Walker? Here. Townsend? Here. McKiernan? Here. Holland? Here. All right, we're at our next budget workshop. Mr. Bach, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor, Commission. Um, tonight's workshop is mostly focused on public safety items. As you'll know, we have uh, topics of fire stations, um, patrol stations, our body camera and fiber project, and then 311. And that is the focus for this evening as we go forward. Um, and I will just move forward to move right into it, uh, starting with the fire station, which is requested by Commissioner Kane. I did ask Mr. Connor and the Chief to just give us a, a quick run through of what we have in the budget, and then we can go to the Commissioner from there. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Connor. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, 
the slide that we have here just depicts the budget page and the dollar amounts that we have proposed in the 17-18 the budget for fire station builds and also for design and land acquisition. And what we've done is we've staggered the build with design in the following year. So we build one one year, design one the next year, build one after that, and keep kind of going down that path. We feel that's a more sustainable solution to uh, building a fire station every other year as opposed to every year. Um, and it's something that's, that's very achievable, we think. Uh, and, and, and this is in conjunction with our public works department that's going to help us with that. Um, and this is something we've gone over with the chief as well. So budget-wise, that's what we're proposing. Um, didn't know what else to report on at this point, so I'd kind of stand for, for questions. All right. Commissioner Kane. Are we going to break ground by the end of this year or no? I think the, uh, the, the kicker on that is we have options on property that we are working to acquire, though our options are conditional upon other options that could have an impact on us. I don't know, Joe, if we can provide a lot more detail at this point. Um, well, being in the land acquisition, excuse me, being in the land acquisition phase, I think that's being finalized. Uh, you know, there's still some um, uh, confidentiality aspects of that. Uh, so, as, you know, as far as going into too much detail on that, I think that that's looking very positive. And uh, that could uh, be determined here shortly. Uh, we are also beginning the design phase, um, you know, of that project. And so I think that uh, that can that can come together quickly, but uh, is dependent upon the uh, finalization of the land acquisition. So hopefully um, that could occur, but I can't say that we will break ground before the end of the year because it's. Uh, there's things that are uh, more dependent upon that uh, may take a little longer than expected. I like the idea that we're at least trying to design it before we get the final uh, property. So I think that's a really good idea. That's sure. That's kind of the process we want to try to establish as we go on down in the years. You design and then build and design and then build. And so that will give the fire department a kind of a cadence with how to, how to move things forward. You know, I think that taking on the uh, the, the task of multiple fire stations being designed and built you know, over a period of time. I think what we learn uh, in this initial phases of this process will de determine a lot of our activities going forward in the future. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, there's a chance that you know, maybe through that, the process could be uh, accelerated or some things uh, as far as projects are added maybe towards, you know, looking towards 2021, you know, uh, the possibility of, you know, do we look at, could we, you know, take on building the fourth station or do we look at it every other year type of process? Because, you know, the, what the need we have out there, of course, it's more than just uh, these three fire stations, but I think uh, how we get started is how this thing goes. And we'll learn a lot in this process because frankly, it's been a while since we, we built a fire station. Okay. Filbert. Now, I just, excuse me. I just wanted to make sure I understood exactly what, as a big picture, what you guys are saying. So you're in the, you're already in design phase. Is, is that correct for this one out west? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so how long does the design phase usually take? We're actually looking at the land first. Right. Well, I mean, finalizing the land acquisition phase is, uh, you know, kind of. Will determine. T getting that taken care of. But we're not waiting uh, to. Uh, do what's necessary um, so that we can uh, anticipate and work through a proper design so when the time comes we're ready to go so we're, we're doing that simultaneously there's a process regarding the design phase whether it involves uh, you know the different types of design build or you know having an architect involved and all that that's what we're working through uh, right now so we don't have to have the design totally finished before we before we do a shovel, a shovel turning to say we're actually going to be building, is that correct? Right, and that, that's part of the land evaluation that we're undergoing right now to make sure it's going to fit, it's going to work. Are there any major issues, any major hurdles? Right now, we're not seeing too many, but once we make that decision, then it's like the chief said, we're following up with what's the station going to have in it, what okay. features will it have, how many bays will it have, all those different details. Right now, I. Yeah, I know. I understand. You have to know exactly where you're putting it so you know where you have the land and how it has to lay and all that. Sometimes. I understand that. But you also are, <laughs> have in process right now 
what you really want out there as a minimum and what the maximum is somewhere somewhere in between is probably what we're going to be getting is that right I mean, you know what uh, I as know, far I'm as the, picky, aren't I? But, oh, no. no, no you no. know, I think uh, we've done a good job in estimating the approximate cost, uh, uh, you know, through the budget process. And I think what we'll find is uh, it'll probably all come together in regards to available monies to do the project and, and the structure and function of that facility and what's appropriate in regard to our resources out in that area. And, like, and as you say, you're being appreciative of the fact that you guys haven't determined what you know a new one in a long time and you want to be careful about what you're doing and be realistic about the money and so on and so forth and i and i appreciate that and i know commissioner kane appreciates that uh you know because he wants money for other stuff too like the rest of us so thank you very much I, and i'll probably have more questions later you know how that is anytime sure. thanks all right any other questions on the plan for the fire stations All right, thank you, Chief. Sure. Mr. Connor, thank you. Joe, would you advance this slide for me? All right, the next um, we have was two topics requested by commissioners. One was regarding a Northeast patrol station. The other was regarding a traffic unit relocation. Uh, neither of these are ones we have anything in the budget on, so I don't have anything to present. Okay. Commissioner Bynum. You go, girl. I'm right thank behind you. you. Um, Starting with the Northeast Patrol Station, uh, it's a concept that um, Commissioner Townsend and Johnson and I had talked about uh, among ourselves and also had mentioned publicly at a variety of different meetings. Um, ideally, we would um, create a Northeast Patrol Station north of Washington and east of 635, and if you can picture that area, it's a it's a significant uh, chunk of geography that currently has as its patrol station police headquarters at 7th and, and Minnesota. Um, I had gone through the um, police study that was completed several months ago and just had met with the chief and Commissioner Johnson. We had a good meeting last week, We and I had just brought to him uh, some pages out of that study that I think speak a little bit to the need um, possibly for us to seriously consider uh, making plans to to build an east patrol station somewhere in that geography um, one of the pages in the study references that east patrol had handled 62 percent more calls than the midtown patrol um, east patrol had handled 29,875 calls for service um, which ended up being 62% more than the Midtown Station. Um, just the rating of the headquarters building itself in the police study, it rated all of our facilities. And of course we know that we have two that are new and, and in really good shape and, and several that are old, but that uh, headquarters building had been noted as um, not a lot of room for expansion there. I don't find the parking to be um, extremely conducive to public participation with the police. So for me, it's a matter of um, building a station much like um, the South Patrol did with the process that they went through and the community input that was achieved and, um, you know, having not only adequate parking, but room for the community to participate inside the building with the police department. And my request really is just that we're going to uh, begin our Northeast master planning process in earnest, probably within the next 30 to 60 days. And I would really like for um, public visioning on a Northeast patrol station to be a part of the master planning process not so much that I'm making a request for money in the 18 budget, um, but I think it could be a real catalyst for a variety of reasons, not just serving the needs of our department, but serving the needs of the community. So I just wanna keep it on radar. Um, I, I think we'll ask our consulting firm that this be very much a part of the master planning process. And Chief, I didn't know if you wanted to 
chime in on any of this or either of the commissioners that, that have talked about it? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll just stop there. Um, I, I think from the beginning when we talked about the Northeast Master Plan, uh, my sense was that we should have a police station in Northeast. I'm, when I look at the map, I'm just a little surprised that we don't already have, have one there. But um, in essence, as we talked about, it would serve two districts, uh, District 4, District 1. Um, and uh, when I look at the statistical report that we received from you, um, those are two of the districts that have uh, some of the highest number of crimes if, well, just, well, some of the highest number of crimes and particularly when you look at the number of violent crimes in particular. So I'm convinced that as we talk about um, development east of 635, um, we've got to consider the realities of safety and even the perception of safety um, in every area of our county. Um, and I hear Commissioner Bynum talk every once in a while, she mentions the word equity. And um, I think that this is as much an issue of equity as the struggle that we are currently in, in terms of finding a grocery store that will provide fresh food. I look at this in the same context uh, of that. Uh, so um, as we're moving forward with the development of the master plan, I, it's no doubt in my mind that public safety is gonna come up. You know, it's gonna come up as part of what we ought to do, what, need, what people need to see. And um, I think that we need to, it's why we need to continue to have this forward looking conversation as I would phrase it, uh, concerning having a police station in terms of what that might cost, where the best location would be, um, so that once it comes up, as I predict it will soon in that conversation, we'll be at least a little bit more prepared to ha have that discussion. So I appreciate you meeting with us and giving us some <clears throat> real honest feedback on that and uh, uh, look forward to having further conversations about it. Thanks. Commissioner Philbrook and then Townsend. Well, I know it's not my area, but as I think about all, as the Northeast uh, master plan, which is, and we're in dire need of, um, so we can actually plan far ahead as well as soon. Uh, I, I wonder when we talk about um, safety, if we're maybe considering putting both fire and police, you know, integrous because the, you know, if you're gonna, we're gonna have to do some change around on fire stations anyway, if we're gonna be doing some changing and some, and some um, building, why not get the best bang for our buck, you know, and, and integrate that, that uh, possibility. Uh, now, if that's a problem, okay, fine, you know, but just wondering. You know, if that couldn't be done, and um, the uh, and the other th and the other thing is, is that I know that there's been a, a lot of comment over the last four years about it being not having um, oh, enough fire and police, and not you know, not that not that people are saying that that fire is not doing a good job. They are, but if we start changing things around, we want to make sure that people are covered. And so that's where my, where I come from. I want us, I want us to get the best bang for our buck is what I'm after. All right, Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> my, my central comment about this is that with the Northeast Master Plan, that plan was to focus primarily on economic development opportunities and possibilities. And while I think this may be a good idea. I certainly don't want that Northeast Master Plan with the economic development focus that it was geared to have uh, to be thrown off track with this issue. This is so major that I think it would probably uh, be in our best interest if we had a separate analysis of that. Certainly it should be a part of that conversation and forward thinking. But just so it's clear from my perspective, uh, when I brought that forward, it was really about uh, economic development. 
And so if this can be some part or consideration, fine, but I think ultimately that may need a separate track on its own. Uh, I don't believe that this was contemplated also when we sent that out for RFP as part of the scope either. So just those comments. That's all. I would uh, just respond to, to that. I think that this is part of that. I think that one goes with the other um, as we talk about economic development. And I agree that in terms of prioritization, that discussion needs to ha be had, you know, what goes first. But I don't know that you can adequately talk about economic development in a realistic perspective without addressing the need of, of, of safety or the perceived safety that is provided by a station that is there. In fact, we, that comment has been brought back to us when we talk about economic development and developers have asked a general question, how do you solve for crime? While a station in and of itself does not do that, I think it helps to address that by at least having it part of the discussion in terms of where, where it might be, what place is it in line, so to speak, you know, as we talk about development. Um, so I would say that you can't have one without the other, just in response. Well, go ahead, no, go Commissioner ahead. Townsend. Well, I was going to say, I do know that as we're looking at new public infrastructure, where there's fire stations, police stations, um, we need to be thinking about those strategically in the context of economic development. We did that at um, Indian Springs, the $5.5 million transit center that includes our Midtown Patrol. Um, was contemplated for exactly that reason in terms of how to leverage economic development. Um, the South Patrol um, is leveraging that economic development and vice versa for security around the shopping areas. So I think as we think about economic development, we have to think about public safety and the impact, the positive impact that a, public's work, a public works project has on economic impact. If we're going to invest you know, $4 million in a new fire station. Um, if we're gonna do a new fire station, and we need to do 10, I mean, our fire stations are in deplorable condition. If we're gonna build a new fire station in an area, we want to leverage it around a map that's generating economic development mm -hmm. and not just put it on an island. We wanna put it somewhere where, there's going, where it's gonna help leverage additional activity. So mm -hmm. I think including this in the conversation in the Northeast Master Plan is critical and layering in the conversation about fire stations as well mm -hmm. is um, critical. So I, I think it's very appropriate as this comes online to make sure that we, that, that is discussed. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Townsend? I, I do agree it should be part of the discussion, but when we're actually talking about where and the level of detail so that we get the right place in the right time, that may require a, a whole separate thing, and that was my point. Absolutely. We've got the Northeast Master Plan for that, and it certainly should be a part of the conversation, but to do justice by this, if we want this, that may take its own study or, or focus. Um, Chief, do you want to have any reflection on this? Um, uh, you know, I do like the idea of the public safety stations. If you built fire police combos, I mean, I do like that. But outside that, I really don't have any comment on the subject. Okay. Can I ask a question of the chief? Sure. <clears throat> have you ever, in your experience, anywhere in the metropolitan area, seen police and fire at the same building? West Patrol. 82nd Street. In case how, is that, how has that worked out? 80th. Well, I think the problem with West Patrol right now is that for us, it's too small. We've outgrown that space. And then when they built it, they built it, I think, just on the contingency that the police department would never grow with personnel. And uh, But it's been fine, been good neighbors. We get along great with the firemen. Well, I, I want to, I was going to suggest that in most communities where I've been, the reason they don't build them, there is a reason that they don't build them together and that I'm sure has something to do with the friendly adversarial nature of police and fire. Now, Chief, you drive anywhere, and I'm not talking about just here in the inner city areas, I'm talking about out south. They don't build fire and police together. There's no reason they can't. It seems like it'd be economically, at least the cost of a bigger piece of ground, but. 
I don't think we're going to make that decision today. I'm not going to be here to worry about it. Well, thanks a lot. But who are you going to call when they when they get to the brawling over something? You. Who do you call? Sheriff. The sheriff. The sheriff. <laughs> just not, kidding. Just kidding. I All right. Not see just that kidding. Happen. All right. Um, traffic unit relocation, Mr. Bach. We currently rent space up on. Uh, Leavenworth Road. Um, I will say that I would like to have our officers in better space. Um, I will, probably the big picture here that we've looked at probably goes a little bit on the end of the conversation we were just having, that in noting that we have several fire facilities up along Leavenworth Road, that there may be a great opportunity in the acquisition of land in the change of that one of those stations that either it be a joint facility or at least land where I could look at a bigger long range picture. And that's one reason that I haven't pushed hard or I've been a little reluctant to invest a lot of money. The chief and I have had some pretty big discussions on the potential relocation of the traffic unit because I do not feel like we have a real strong landlord in the way they take care of our property today. And I do like to make sure officers have good facilities to be in. However, trying to be forward thinking about how I could put that together with a greater project. And that's why there's nothing in the budget now to do anything with the Northeast, Northeast or the um, traffic unit. Uh, and that's where it sets today. All right, Commissioner Bynum and then Walker. And then Jay. Well, and again, the reason I had requested this is because um, the shopping center at 6,000 Leavenworth Road, where the traffic unit has been since 1995, is um, pretty pitiful. And I was, when I met with the chief, I was telling him my story of my history of taking the job at the Leavenworth Road Association after my predecessor had done all of the work to uh, get the traffic unit located there, and then I got the honor of joining the police to cut the ribbon. So. Uh, I'm well aware of that facility and it's in 1995 it was very nice because it was completely renovated space and it was brand new within that old shopping center but that is not the case today um, it did not um, revitalize that shopping center in any way um, I think that we're asking for a commitment to Find a better place uh, for the traffic unit, but keep it on Leavenworth Road. I had actually sent Chief Siegler like five different photographs over the weekend of buildings and locations on Leavenworth Road that could be potentially looked at. But I think I also like the bigger picture, the more long-term <laughs> picture of possibly a police fire combo in that area because we know we have two stations there. I would say fire station four, I think it's four, at 81st and Leavenworth Road would be one of the fire stations that is kind of most desperate for being built brand new. So that to me, a police presence and a fire presence already existing on Leavenworth Road, both in conditions that are less than ideal, I think lends itself to an immediate look at maybe a police fire combo for those. But anyway, um, what I really want is to get the traffic unit out of that location on Leavenworth Road. So, thank you. All right, Commissioner Walker and then Philbert. I, I would ask the rhetorical question when we're talking about these new fire stations and police stations, does anyone ever think about putting anything in Turner? I, I say that somewhat in jest because I've made that a, a, a refrain, but I've got two of the oldest, most decrepit fire stations sitting in my district, or my, my home of my district. There's plenty of newer fire stations that have been built in all your other districts, except maybe Piper. We're talking about moving the, the traffic unit I just asked the question, what what would be wrong with the traffic unit being located out in Turner? I mean, the, the idea is, is that uh, we're all supposed to share equally in this. 
and the benefits of consolidation and uh, you know no offense to Commissioner Merguia but she stole my fire station in Turner and now it's down in Argentine no, please, please. Oh. I'm sorry, please. <laughs> She'd steal a fire station if she could, too. So I, I, I get the idea that. Uh, Had Kane on after me. Um, well, I think consideration should be given not to one exclusive area. You know, it's been up there since 95. Maybe there's a better place to put it. And I, I tell you, ground's a lot cheaper out where I am than out in Piper. Commissioner Philbrook and then Kane. So, so first, when I, when I was first elected, and I already knew that that was like a terrible location for anybody to be in to do business. It was like I wanted to go in and I. Guys, don't take this personal, but I wanted to call the state on them, you know, and say, come down and inspect this thing, because it might have creepy crawly things in here and all kinds of diseases that we don't want our men working in. I mean, that is one nasty building, okay? Now, having said that, I don't think that anybody should have to work in that building, and I think he is probably one of the worst. And I know, thank you, Doug, for being so nice. Uh, about the gentleman or whoever it is that owns that location. But I really think that I would be really happy, sir, if you would pick up and leave because then we could actually let somebody come in and develop that piece of property and clean it up because that is a big piece of blight. That is one of our biggest pieces of blight up north up there. And um, I don't think anybody should have to work around that. And I know people, unless you are, unless you go up and down that Leavenworth Road or unless you do business around there, you don't notice. It's not, it's something you just zip past and you don't pay attention to. But that, that area could be used for some economic development. And so I, I don't like doing business and handing money, our money over, our tax money over to somebody that is not really playing well with others. In other words, he's not taking care of his property. He's, you know, and we're take, you know, but he's taking our money. He's happy to take our money to let somebody stay there. So I have a real problem with that. Um, now, as far as, as far as getting ready, getting rid of our no North Patrol, I would tell you that, that I'm definitely not going to suggest that. There's no way I would suggest that because because well, you've got a lot of territory to cover back up in those hills and around there, and there's a lot of stuff that goes up around up north, uh, and we really do need to keep our keep our keep a patrol up in that area. Um, what else do I need to tell you? Yes, there are there are some locations where we could possibly build, and I would ask that that we take into consideration when we're looking at all all of these other options on on police and fire that we consider the possibility of putting them together. But we already have some properties up along there that might be, we might be capable of utilizing. So um, right now, that's, yeah, I feel a little passionate about this because I'm sick of looking at this location. Thank you. Commissioner Kane. Uh, Commissioner Walker, uh, we did have discussion about combining them and putting the two fire stations in Pearson Park. And, and that's been, forever and ever and ever. I mean, it's one of the, in fact, that's one of the very first things we talked about before we talked about moving one out west was combining the, the two that you guys got up there and come out of Pearson Park, which I think would be a great idea. And, and you know, we all talk about, uh, <clears throat> we want a police station here, police station there. I just want a couple of, uh, more police officers out west. We've had an uptick in, in crime. And uh, uh, we need as much coverage. We pay for as much coverage and we want as much coverage as the rest of the city gets. All right. Can, can I make a comment, Mayor? Yes, Chief. Uh, to uh, Commissioner uh, Walker's point, uh, we did move our South Patrol operation down off 18th and Metropolitan. However, we did move the Special Operations Unit back to 34th Street. So they currently occupy the old South Patrol. So we, do have a we did maintain a police presence in that area, sir. Let me ask you about you brought it up. I wasn't going to I wasn't going to bring it up again. But I, I am going to bring it up. 
when we're talking about South Patrol that Turner had, what what was that? What was that before it was South Patrol? Uh, you the building? Yeah. Oh, you probably would know better than I would, sir. I, I don't know. Yeah, it it was not. This this is a a small house. Yep. There was never any service there. You couldn't go knock on the door and get a policeman. There was no report desk. A bunch of guys just got there, checked in, got their cars, drove off, and that was the end of it. So we've never, in Turner, had a real patrol. That's, that's a given. We had a base there, but most of the people, Turner has fewer patrol officers, or used to, than any other part of the city. <laughs> We have crime too, we pay taxes. Just like Mike said, we're entitled to service. All right. I've made my point. It was never a patrol station. So the idea that somehow Turner had this grand city built, and a city never built it. I think at one time it belonged to a, a well I know it belongs, who's gonna, didn't it belong to the, the original owner, Matney? And Matney sold it to the city. It was, it was it was a storage area for the cemetery, and we converted it into a patrol station with a few desks. All right. Which had, you had nothing to do with it. Long, in fact, that must go back to the '60s. I think uh, Commissioner Walker brings up a, a great point that we've had some discussion on in here, but not a lot. Probably more of it's been with public safety, but. One of the chief's directions has been enabling our new, our two new patrol stations to be able to allow us some field reporting. Um, when we opened Midtown, we were not really quite equipped for that, but we, we positioned it and we put a report station in the front of it so we could allow citizens to come in. Um, and then we did the same thing at South Patrol. And the chief going through his evaluations came up with a very efficient methodology for this for us working forward in that we have teleserve operators that currently answer the phone when you want to call in and report crime. Um, they stay relatively busy. However, the philosophy of they don't, with today's technology, we don't need to have them all sitting in the same room. There's no magic to that, that they all need to sit together and answer the phone while they look at each other. So he could move teleserve operators out into the new patrol stations where we are physically designed for them to come in. So that way a person can either elect to call and get that operator or they can walk through the door and get that operator. And then when we have light duty officers, they're able to work in that role, which is primarily how we've done a lot of stuff at Midtown. But I think it's been a very efficient act on the part of the chief to study his operations work with new technology and put us in a position where we can now staff these patrol stations and it probably adds one of the points to looking at our our west station or even our uh, maybe the new northeast one if we think if we're able to proceed in that regard that it becomes more than just a point of entry because i think as commissioner walker has said previously when it's just a station where it's it's the efficiency of how quickly we move from an operational area the interaction with the public is minimal but with these two new stations that changed and that that does become more of an impact on the surrounding neighborhood so i think that may change the way we look at some of these going forward and whether that impacts traffic unit or not i don't know that's a little bit different um, but that may be a different opportunity there as well but we're able to do that without adding staff and pulling them in and chief i don't know if you have any other comment on that but i just kudos to you as you continue to advance when we look at things different operations you come up with ways to do it within your existing budget with your existing personnel and advance to provide better service All right. Commissioner Walker how long is <clears throat> I, apparently you caught me flat-footed on the special operations how long are we going to continue to use South Patrol I mean old South Patrol well, I mean, uh, you know, for, this, for the officers that are occupying that, there's 12 officers that occupy that opposed to 40 when we were using it as a division uh, station. So we could keep going the way we are until we could get something built or relocate to a, another facility. Uh, that unit does require a considerable amount of storage for its special equipment. 
So that would be something that would have to be taken into consideration. But, um, you know, for now, it is serving the purpose uh, that we're using it for, and we've got space there. Did I miss when we built South Patrol? Wasn't that going to be where we were, wherever we located South Patrol, we wanted a building big enough that we could house special operations? No, they did not want special operations there. Special op the special operations unit, they've got equipment and whatnot, and putting it down on 18th and Metropolitan, we didn't think that would be good uh, for some of the things that they do. Well, so we gained no efficiencies here. We didn't get rid of a building that we no longer have to maintain. No, we did not. All right. We have... Um, covered the northeast and traffic units. We have a presentation on police body cameras and fiber. This is a big project. Mr. Bach, would you like to give an intro? Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> this is a big project, and I think the combination of what's going on here is a much more global look at how we can move forward into the future. I think it's, you know, we see the body cameras. That's something that gets a lot of attention. And then we talk about fiber individually. This is really the work, and I say great innovation working between our technology, our uh, department, and what goes on within the police department to be able to take one project, leverage into another project, or maybe it's the other project leveraging this project. But fiber is future infrastructure of our community with many possibilities. The body cameras project is something that's the future technology that can be there for use within our department. So coming together to put this together, I, I've been very proud of our staff and what we've developed. Um, and I'm anxious for them to get forward with the presentation. And with that, I'll turn this over to Start Mr. Connor and he'll give the intro with the team we have up here tonight. Sure. So thank you, Mayor and Commissioners again. Um, so this is, we wanna bring back an update on, on our public safety uh, video and fiber. It also has to do with our body cameras. And we've talked to the standing committee a couple of times now, given updates. So this is kind of kind of serve a dual purpose for us as an update for all of you. And then also uh, talk about what's what's in, in the budget for this year. Um, with us is Casey Meyer, the attorney for the police department, and Alan Howes, our, our chief knowledge officer. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn that over to Alan, go ahead and get us started. Mayor Commission. So we're going to touch on three areas <clears throat> tonight. We'll talk uh, briefly about the network and sort of the infrastructure around it. Um, hand it over to the chief and talk in more depth about the body cameras um, and themselves. And then we'll uh, circle back for a third section on sort of community fiber and the sort of the, the dual use multi-purpose aspects of the fiber planning that's gone underway. So as uh, Mr. Bach mentioned, we're really talking about multi-purpose assets and uh, using the ability of fiber to carry lots and lots of data to support a range of activities. So this includes body cameras, in-car cameras, things like traffic cameras, uh, building and remote locations for, say, public works facilities or other places, uh, doing things like connecting up our 911 center to Johnson County to use it as a, as a backup facility. Uh, for other regional public safety connections, connecting up uh, more directly to KCMO, Johnson County, and other regional partners, and uh, thinking about emergency incident response and how we use this to support whether it's storm response or, um, or other sorts of emergency incidents. In developing the fiber network, uh, we are prioritizing the police locations, and this map shows you uh, there's really a, a tier one, tier two, uh, or phase one, phase two, the blue dots are phase one, um, and this connects up the majority of the police locations. The, the part that sort of jumps off the map on the phase two is that those are extensions you know, beyond sort of the parallel and state um, core network, and so those would be built um, soon in, in following the initial build out um, but as we heard from the conversation earlier today, even uh, conversations around station locations may impact the, the, the pace at which we build out to a particular location. So the, uh, the network design, we're looking to build a private uh, UG network. It would have 72 fibers. 
uh, of those 12 of those fibers. So you think of, they come in sheaths of 12. So think of a, a dozen in a bundle. There'd be a sheath that would be reserved only for public safety. And uh, this is also in part to, uh, to be compliant with uh, police information security protocols, CGIS, KCGIS. Uh, and so we have physically separated mm -hmm. fiber carrying the specific uh, workloads for public safety. Um, we also, as I said, have the connection to what's called the Carrier Hotel in downtown Kansas City, Missouri. This is an interconnect uh, where uh, bub both public and private entities come together. It's where uh, KCMO and Johnson County also have interconnects, so it gives us the ability, again, to directly connect uh, through private networks uh, to other regional partners. And our timeline here is uh, fiber network build out in uh, this year and into next year, and roll out of body cameras in 2018. Um, briefly on, on here, as we say, when we think about the, but the network and we think about multi-purpose assets, it costs essentially the same whether you put one fiber in the ground or whether you put 100 fibers in the ground. The cost of this is largely borne by opening up the ground itself. And so when we think about um, creating assets and you know, when we're making investments, uh, whether to, to create a network to support the police body cameras, how can we also leverage that investment to support other operations? Uh, and we'll talk in a little bit. When we talk about uh, rebuilding a road, you know, how can we, and we're opening the ground already, how can we go ahead and put in place the conduit that would allow us to support future fiber connectivity? So it's really thinking about those sorts of incremental investments that, that allow us to make them, to maximize the, the scarce public dollars that, that are available. Equipment and budget here. Um, so you'll see, and the chief will talk about this as well. Body cameras, there's 228 units uh, planned. There's 83 in car um, units. And there's uh, funding um, across 17 and 18, across uh, both uh, operating and capital. Um, there's funding in public works for fiber connectivity, um, and then this is a, a million dollars. About half of that would be used for the police network build out and about half for other connections. So you think of almost like a, like a complete streets uh, effort where you've got some sections where you're just missing a small segment and you need to build out a small segment. Others where, again, as you're doing a public works project and you're opening the ground, you wanna have enough funds to be able to put the conduit in the ground to support that future connectivity. And then there is an ongoing cost, and we're building that into the budget as well, uh, both for, for the network security and operations, um, as well as the video storage requirements that come along with capturing and recording uh, a good bit of video data, both from body cameras and from, as the police are now, from, from in-car cameras. Uh, last point there, we did in January put in for a DOJ grant for the tune of about 350000 We have not heard back from that. and. I wouldn't budget on that, but just so you know that that is out there, um, and you know we're we're hopeful that that would come through. With that, I'll turn it over to the chief. Thank you. Uh, this is Chuck Wexler, is the yeah, executive yeah. director yeah, of the hold police. Hold on one Institute. second, Chief Commissioner McKernan. Right. I just have one question. Sure. So we've got a million. And you, I've asked this before. You've answered it. Remind me again. Google Fiber comes into Kansas City. We make a big deal about it. They tear up all the streets and they promise that there's going to be connectivity for public buildings, and yet we're going to spend a million on fiber connectivity. So, what happened? That's, good. That's an excellent question. And I think that there are a couple ways to think about it. Um, one is there's internet connectivity, which is what Google is offering through the Community Connections Program. In other words, you can get to Gmail or you can get to you know, CNN or you know, other publicly available internet sites. Um, there's another part of the of connectivity, which is private networks. Um, and this is things like, you think about body cameras. At each of the patrol locations, the officers would be coming in, potentially those locations at the end of their shift, um, downloading a whole bunch of data that data doesn't necessarily need to go to the internet and back in order to, to, to be housed within the UG. So we're creating a private network that would carry that from that station to, for example, police headquarters. And so there are other uh, 
workloads like that where having a, a private network, think of you know, um, traffic signals as another one where you don't need the public internet, you need a private connection that links together, sort of think of each of these microphones as a traffic signal. If you want to have a smart traffic signal network, you're connecting each of those by fiber, uh, but that doesn't need to touch the, the outside world. So we're saying that there is not enough data security on the existing network to protect our data, and we're going to build our own point-to-point -point network. Our data cannot be protected in the existing infrastructure, so we're going to go off the grid for all intents and purposes and build our own point-to-point. I think security and information security is a, is a part of that. So if you go outside, uh, so beyond the, the private network, now you're talking about encrypting data. Um, there's an, a cost associated with that and a performance associated with that. You're talking about, again, sort of sensitive data loads. Um, that, so there, there's that aspect of it as so well. So have other municipalities that are using body cameras and communicating these data from point to point are they using existing infrastructure or are they also building their own point-to-point -point networks? Uh, I think it's a combination. In a lot of uh, larger jurisdictions, they are, in fact, building out or have their own private fiber networks um, to carry that, and, and we'll speak to that here in just a little bit as well. Just make one more comment about Google. I mean, they were clear when they came into our community that they're not providing business class service. And what the, what the police department requires is a very high level of maintenance, storage, security, and, and Google's providing these community connections. They're not, they're, they're apples and oranges. And so when we, you know, we're making this decision to how to, how to transfer this data, you know, we, we had to have, you know, a higher level of service that Well, Google whether it's Google to. or any of the other providers that already have lines and, and switching centers and routing centers out there. So our, we want a higher level of data security and that's driving us to not use existing networks, but rather build our own. There's that, and there's a, there is a cost savings component um, to this as well. So okay. the connection to a call the carrier hotel allows us to buy essentially wholesale priced internet. So when we think about how we purchase connectivity today, we purchase it at point to point at lots of different stations. So uh, you know, just use South Patrol as an example. They've got, um, I think, believe it's Spectrum that provides their connectivity now. Um, we have a, you know, we pay a bill for that service for that station, you know, every month, and we do that for a lot of UG facilities. And this allows us to essentially buy in bulk for those services. And based on the experiences of other communities, we do expect to see that we would get a reduced rate on the on the internet that we're purchasing. So there's a range, and I'm happy to go into much more detail with you. Commissioner Philbrook. So isn't there a, a, um, a DOJ component to this where we really, you know, Department of Justice really wants to make sure that we are not taking any chances with our, with our data? And is there been some pushback from, from Kansas on any level, you know, from from having um, being in contact with the state organizations, you know, on about police and so on and so forth, you know, I mean, because every once in a while I'll get a little rumbling from the state level about, well, are we going to be, you know, compliant, that sort of thing, and are we going to really be paying attention to what we're doing and not taking any chances so we can interface with, with other folks. I know he's like, well, oh, God, what did I just say? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? If I think I've heard your question correctly, it was? Around, around the DOJ and, you know, it was around the Department of Justice because they're really picky about some of, this, some of these things and the, and the interfacing of us being able to get information from other organizations that also have that are under the Justice Department. I'm just asking, has there been any kickback on any of that? Or, I mean, has there been any talk around that or anything like that? There's a recognition that, again, these are, some of these are very uh, sensitive sort of information uh, sources or connections. And so, you know, the, I know that the PD pays a lot of attention to 
right. information security and um, network security, and that would that wouldn't right. change under having a, a private network. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm just asking because I know that it that there was a couple of comments made several years ago about us having possibly having issues around uh, sharing information. You know, and that's why I'm asking. <coughs> Commissioner Walker. Chief, we, maybe a year ago, maybe it was two years ago, had a million dollars from somewhere to get body cameras. And we, we had applied for a federal grant a couple years ago and we turned that grant down. I have to say, at the no, time, wasn't I had the impression that the commission was gung ho to get body cams. And I know that. You were very persuasive and cogent in your argument at that time why we shouldn't proceed to do that. And could you, maybe I'm the only one that needs illumination on what's different now. So, so um, back when we applied for the DOJ grant, I believe it was about the same amount of money, about $350,000. One of the issues that I saw um, that I had problems with in advancing the body camera project at that time was the state was looking at changing the open records uh, statue, which may have made it easier uh, uh, for people to get copies of the videos, which would have created a workload on the police department, uh, a huge workload on us. So that was one issue. We weren't sure what the state law, the state, state uh, legislatures were gonna do with the uh, CORA law. The second piece of that, was was that I knew at the time that we did not have a fiber uh, connectivity to be able to wirelessly download the videos and then move them to the storage uh, the storage place. So at the time when I went before the commission, uh, the commission decided to give that money. I believe it was about five hundred thousand dollars to the police department for us to be able to start laying a fiber network. So at some point we could advance the body camera project. And uh, even right now, as I said here today. I mean, we're making great strides in getting that network, but it's still not complete. And that's been almost two years ago. And so uh, if we would have gotten the grant and set money aside, I think the money would have just sat there because we weren't in a position at that point uh, to move forward with the project. But apparently we're, we're, we're thinking we're close enough that now we can proceed with body cameras well and my first comment was going to be uh based on the statements of chuck wexler who's the police executive research forum director in the first paragraph he talks about the fact that police departments that institute a body worn camera project once they're implemented and there's an expectation uh, from the public that we're recording everything in a financial crisis or otherwise, it will be very difficult for the unified government and the police department to scale back a body camera project once we implement it. And, and there are costs, even now as I sit here today, I worry about the cost. Uh, for instance, the Wichita Eagle published an article several weeks ago that said, um, as a result of Wichita's body camera project, the district attorney's office had to hire two, two new ADAs to help process the video evidence that comes in, as well as their cost to public defenders went up because the public defenders, if they're given 40 hours of video on a case that's gonna be used, they have to be compensated for watching 40 hours of video. And those were costs that Wichita had not calculated or foreseen. And, and that's some of my concerns I come before you today. And that's what I was gonna talk about was uh, kind of where I think we're at. Go ahead. Okay, so that was the first uh, paragraph. The second paragraph, or the, I'm sorry, the, the last one, the third one speaks to the fact that, you know, body cameras are a great tool. They're a great tool for law enforcement if you can afford them and you can sustain them. But one thing that has always been a concern, and even with the uh, perf that they see is that body cameras could cause a chilling effect on the relationship between the police and the public. It could be that officers would become rather short in their interactions with public when, because they know that it's being recorded, so they want to be professional, as well as the public might not be so willing to engage law enforcement officers in the field because they know their interactions are being videotaped as well. And those are just some things that 
you know, I just want you guys to be aware of as we move this thing forward that it's, it's a great tool, but there are some negative or could be negative consequences of implementing it. So some of the benefits, these are some of the benefits that uh, PERF and IACP uh, has seen improved officer safety, enhanced public trust, uh, improved evidence documentation, increased officer accountability, uh, improve officer training and reduce liability. For the agencies that have implemented body camera projects, uh, on average, they see about a 60% reduction in uses of force among those officers who are wearing body cameras. They see on average about an 88% decrease in the number of internal affairs complaints that are filed. Now, our uses of force, uh, are we, we have applications of, of force about 2.3% of the time we make an arrest. Uh, we have not had a fatal shooting in our city since 2014 with an officer. Um, with an officer shooting a citizen. And uh, we've had a 52% reduction in attitude and conduct and harassment complaints against our officers in the last two years. So without cameras, I believe organizationally, our officers are doing the right things and we're moving in the right direction. Uh, and the other thing is that these are some of the benefits, but cameras don't catch everything. We know that in some shootings when an officer um, draws, points, and discharges, a lot of time the camera will catch the firearm in the inside of the officer's arms. It doesn't always hear what the officer hears. The cameras do not have the peripheral view that an officer has, but it's a good piece of evidence. But you have to remember that body-worn cameras are not a cure-all or solve all problems, um, but they're still helpful. Uh, best practices, you know, we looked at IACP and we looked at PERF, obviously, and the Department of Justice. A lot of good literature out there from those organizations. Uh, we have a draft policy that's, I would say, uh, if we needed to implement it today, it, it's ready to go. Um, we have sent to the district attorney's office, to the union, to the city legal department. A lot of people have looked at that policy uh, protocols, and I think that they're pretty comfortable with it. Um, the next two things there are privacy considerations, veto review, supervisor review, and retention. I'm going to cover those in the next couple of slides. So in general here, uh, there is, if an officer gets called to a scene, there is no expectation of privacy on the part of the citizen. And uh, our intention is to capture, record all police citizen interactions uh, that occur on a call for service or otherwise. Um, if a citizen requests for the camera to be turned off, the officer will document that with the video camera, the reason, and whether or not he's gonna turn the camera off or not. It's the officer's, ultimately it's the officer's decision on whether or not he continues recording. Um, officers will, some of the discussion uh, recently has been about whether or not officers should review uh, video footage before they write reports. Our policy would be is that officers can review the body camera video prior to writing the reports. Uh, if we had an officer involved shooting, what we would do is we would take the officer's statement first and then show them the recording after we take their initial statement and ask any clarifying questions. So even in those instances, they will be allowed to view it, but it will be after we take the initial statement. Uh, the supervisors in the field, as well as the command staff, they will do periodic reviews of a certain percentage of the videos just to review them to make sure that policies and procedures are being followed and that, you know, we don't have any issues. So um, I think that's a pretty good practice of doing random, uh, random reviews of the videos. The retention policy, uh, 120 days, um, you know, that, that's pretty good. Use of force uh, instances will keep forever. Officer involved shootings, lawsuits, those will be retained forever. Uh, we did talk to uh, the legal department considerably about, you know, retaining videos for litigation. Those would be kept indefinitely. Uh, this policy, I believe, on the retention is pretty much in line with uh, what other jurisdictions are doing. And then I'm going to turn it over to Casey Meyer so she can talk about the Open Records Act. Before we do that, Commissioner Murguia, do you want to jump in? Yeah, so Chief, I just want to say, I think you're doing a great job and I do trust your judgment. I think I've talked to you um, on the side about this before. My last 
but I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of body cameras and I just feel like I need to say that out loud. Um, one of the things that um, I think makes Kansas City, Kansas great is the community's involvement with our police officers and how, what an effective tool that that's been in solving crime and um, making our community safer. It's also been great for building relationships between the police officers and our community. And we have groups like NCPP and regular neighborhood groups that meet with community policing officers on a regular basis. I just know that um, by nature, the average citizen is reluctant to get involved in law enforcement situations. But with the current situation, um, they were more likely to be involved. I think that that's gonna go away and I do have a lot of concerns about that. And I'm also concerned about even if there is, um, if you weighed the benefits against the negatives of body cameras, I'm concerned that the margin is so small that it is not um, consistent with the huge cost um, that it's costing us <clears throat> as a government um, to implement something like this. So, you know, I've talked to you about that, um, but you've obviously done a lot more work on this than, than I have, but I do have a lot of concerns about this, and mostly because I can, I can just really speak to my district. The people in my district, and I think every community survey we've ever taken um, demonstrates this, they love our police officers. They think that they're doing a great job um, it's probably the best rating that in the firemen, you two get the best ratings on, our, on the survey, at least in my district. Um, and I think that has to do with the good relationships that your officers build when they're out on the street, not just community police officers, which are really good, but just your regular street patrol officers. And I'm just concerned, just want to reiterate that, that these cameras are going to be very intimidating um, to the general public, especially if they're reporting criminal activity in their own neighborhood or on their own block. So, but again, I trust your judgment and I'm sure you use them to benefit the whole county. Commissioner Walker. On the list of benefits, uh, the one that would stand out for me is uh, the reduction of uh, liability. Has there been any studies by the IAPC or any organization that demonstrate that in fact has resulted in a result. I mean, it makes sense that the police are doing their job correctly. The cameras should theoretically disprove the, you know, people that make fraudulent or bogus claims. And so therefore, but do we have any, anything that substantiate item six there? Do the only thing that I, I think that that's based on is the fact that you have a 60% reduction in use of force. So if you're having less uses of force, there's less litigation involved, excessive use of force. And um, if an incident does occur, now you've got evidence that will prove or disprove the allegations against the officer. And an 88% reduction in uh, internal affairs complaints, I would have to believe that 88% of those, uh, those were all probably false allegations, which takes a lot of time for the legal department to work on. So I think it's just the fact that people behave better and that you do have evidence when something does happen that you might not have otherwise had. Along with those other benefits, you talk about it improving officer training and improve uh, in, in documentation. Number one, are you going to need, a, like the ADAs, are you going to need additional staff because how is it going to help you in training if somebody hasn't reviewed good, bad, normal situations? And is there going to be, in addition to that, a re periodic random review for disciplinary reasons? So we, uh, we currently have in-car cameras and we do random reviews of those every month. And uh, if there's an issue that's identified a policy violation, we do deal with it. Uh, the training piece to that, currently, even our current uh, in-car cameras, we pull videos.
for training purposes and then go over those in in-service training or we use them in our pursuit driving class to give examples of things. Um, so that, that becomes pretty helpful in those two areas uh, and I think it's been pretty effective. And the documentation of evidence, uh, you know, if you can get it on camera, great. I will tell you that uh, in this budget request, as part, as a result of the body camera project, I have requested a civilian position that will manage all of the video and all the requests that come through. Currently we have an employee dedicating probably 40% of her time to doing the in-car cameras. This will grow exponentially because of the number of cameras that we're gonna have to deal with. As well as, I've, I've talked to Alan in technology at the UG, and I have requested an extra IT person to deal specifically with the cameras uh, when they break down, they malfunction in those things. All right, thank you. All right, Chief. Oh, more, uh, Commissioner Townsend. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. Um, I hope that uh, if and when we implement these, it won't have a chilling effect on the uh, cooperation between the citizens and the police. Um, I can think of at least two situations. Uh, one that supported that our police acted correctly. This was an incident off Leavenworth Road not within a month or less of the unfortunate uh, tragic incident in Ferguson. And there were rumblings that uh, there had been un excessive use of force. And the presence of that camera on the car yes. Uh, evidence that our police had acted appropriately and uh, there was nothing to those allegations so if we can better that increase that that's good I hope it won't have a chilling effect um, in the privacy section here can you give me a for instance of what might be an appropriate circumstance when a request is made for an officer to turn off his or her body camera? Um, well, I could think of if you had a child that was a victim of a sex crime, a domestic violence, a rape, uh, and those would be ones that we would want to capture that, you know, hey, we're turning off the camera, we'll document that. Um, some people may just feel uncomfortable talking to an officer on a call. They call us to the house, say a burglary call. Their house has been burglarized. And we get there and they're like, hey, can you turn that camera off, officer? I mean, we're gonna have to deal with that. Some people might not feel comfortable in, in front of a camera. And so we wanna make sure that we've got a, something in our policy, at least we can figure, let an officer figure out how do they step through that. Well, and I think part of that. Commissioner Townsend, I think I Commissioner Mark I was just gonna give an, an example. example. So um, in our neighborhood, uh, particularly in Commissioner McGee's and mine, mm -hmm. there may be individuals that are not in this country legally, and they might make a call for police assistance, but they might be afraid to be on camera because they may fear some sort of implications for their being able to stay as residents here. So that's an example of another circumstance that wouldn't involve the, the crime at all, but the person just might feel like, if I talk on camera, are they gonna review this footage and say, well, he's not supposed to be here and come looking for me at my house. Mm -hmm. Well, that could happen in District 1, too. Yeah. So, um, but then that go, you're, you're right, any district, but then that goes to what if that person is needed as a witness later, if they're afraid to be on camera now, what does that do to the case later? But what I wanted to uh, follow up on is, let's say the camera is turned off. Is there going to be some protocol for booting it back up? At what point do you re-engage the camera? Um, I think that is the officer's discretion. If he believes that he's talked to the individual and they're satisfied, you know, do you mind if I turn the camera back on? Or uh, goes inside and starts processing the uh, crime scene, he can turn the camera back on. We would want the we would want the cameras on mm -hmm. as much as possible. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Commissioner King. How many police cars have the cameras now, and how many don't? All all of the district patrol cars have them. Uh, community policing has cameras uh, right now, in car cameras. 
So, so we've expanded that over the years a little bit compared to what we did have. I'm kind of like Ann. I think a lot of people will shut down and, and won't answer a question because they'll be on camera. And we had, the, we had the car camera going as well, correct? Yes, sir. And we've worked hard to bring the, the uh, police department and the community together. And, and I'm not sure wearing that body camera is gonna help that because there's too much that it can't pick up versus <clears throat> what it can pick up. And uh, I just don't know if we had the financial monies to keep it going because this is a gift that will never quit. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and mm -hmm. I've never seen anything like this on anything that we've done. And, and I know that in certain cities they need them. I'm just not sure that we need them here. Okay, thank you. Okay, Chief, if you wanna continue. Okay, so, um, Issues regarding confidentiality and privacy are primarily addressed in KCA, KSA 45221, which is our open records statute that provides exceptions for disclosure. And there is a specific subsection that addresses criminal investigation records. And last year, the legislature amended 45217 to include body camera video and vehicle camera video um, in the definition of criminal investigation records. So um, that means that if a member of the public or media requested um, a body cam video, then it would be covered under this criminal investigation exception. Um, and then also in that statute, it defines what body camera and vehicle camera is. It's pretty straightforward. In addition, KSA 45254, provides that the following individuals may request to review a body-worn camera or vehicle camera video um, in the following circumstances. And this is, again, a new statute that was um, created in 2016. And remember, this is just reviewing the video only. These requesters would not get a copy of the video. And this would include any person who is the subject of the recording a parent or legal guardian of a person under 18 who was the subject of the recording, an attorney for either of the above parties, an heir, executor, administrator of a decedent when the decedent was uh, the subject of the recording. And by subject, we would include people that were either in the video or that could be heard in the video. And so because that open record statute, it, it includes several different exceptions. It includes medical records or the ab ability to identify a victim in a sexual assault. All those exceptions would still apply to this. So if one of those exceptions fell within here, we would um, redact that and allow the requester to probably only view the section he, he or she was included in. Would that, would that include someone, say there was a robbery at someone's house and there was an investigation and they took a camera through the house. Would the owner of the house be able to see that video even though they're not in it? Well, I, I think that that could be included in the definition of subject of the recording. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Nope. I do have, I do have another legal question um, in terms of um, police supervision. I know how we handle um, police investigations, internal affairs, policeman misconduct is all subject to our union contract. Um, will there need to be updates to our union contract to allow for the use of body worn cameras um, as evidence? I, uh, I don't believe so, Mayor, because we currently have the in car cameras that we're using for disciplinary purposes and for IA investigations, and uh, we just there's not a specific um, section in the contract addressing video, uh, in-car videos and the use of them for, the use of those things for a discipline. So all of our police officers would have the same protections now, in the, it, it would have the same protections under this that they currently have now? Yes. Okay. okay. All right. 
Moving to our, uh, our third section here, and this is back to the concept of, of creating a multi-use community asset. Uh, as Mr. Connor mentioned in the budget kickoff, this is a new initiative and kind of a new way of thinking about uh, how we use the investment in this case for the police body camera network um, as a, again, a multi-purpose community asset. Um, three main focus areas that we see as potential benefits, one, public safety and operations. We've spoken in depth about the public safety side. Uh, there's also uh, benefits to a broad range, potentially of UG operations, um, certainly public works, and, and Jeff and I have had a number of conversations around this, um, uh, ways to hook up remote facilities and uh, to move data around uh, additional opportunities to, re to reduce costs and improve productivity as we've, as we've talking about, and uh, the ability to share data more easily across organizations. Second area uh, is economic development, and this is one just to, to really emphasize because uh, connectivity is really becoming a, a requirement. Um, it's what businesses look at when they're looking where they're going to go, uh, when they're looking at expanding operations. The ability to uh, consume and provide data and information is, you know, is really uh, foundational to a lot of businesses. So you know, the, the corollary to that um, is that insufficient network hinders development. Uh, so Commissioner McKiernan, to your earlier point about um, Google, one of the challenges is that right now we can't uh, say we want to build a line, for example, um, that would provide additional con connectivity down through downtown part of KCK, and that's a, a pain point that we've heard from some businesses that they can't get high quality, high speed access. Well, we can't compel a Google or a Spectrum or other to, to go and build through that area, and, and what they say in response is, well, it's cost prohibitive to us to do it. So if everybody is paying the same full freight for opening the ground and running lines, um, then it you know, it's a disincentive for the telecom providers. If there's a, essentially a shared use asset where we've created a conduit, we're using it for our own operational needs, but there is space in there for other uses, uh, economic uses, then um, that creates new opportunities for economic development. Um, questions on that before we hit the third point? Go ahead, Commissioner. I do. Um, so when we look at these numbers that you're providing to us in terms of the million dollars, I'm also looking at the cost of the body cameras, how much would you equate to the fiber piece of it? Is it just a million dollars? And then all other costs are going to be equated to the body cameras piece. Is that the way to, to look at this? Or is there some sharing somewhere in, in these there, numbers? There's a a little bit uh, of sort of overlap in the Venn diagram there, if you will, um, on equipment, network equipment, that kind of stuff. But the, the million dollars in there is really uh, for fiber, uh, for the connectivity. Uh, and again, about half of that is for the police network build out and half is for uh, using to support existing public works projects so that we build connectivity into those projects. 50-50 split. I, I did hear you say that earlier. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. And the third area is uh, is around community access. So, you know, how do we uh, continue to support the the goals and uh, of creating new opportunities for residents? Um, you know, again, as just like for businesses, connectivity is uh, is a requirement now. So it is for people who are looking for jobs. Uh, for looking for to continuing their education, whether they're students in K through 12 or beyond. Um, so how do we provide opportunities for additional access? Uh, likewise, for recreational and entertainment opportunities, uh, how do we, again, provide, help to provide the bandwidth? Um, and, and this is not to say that we're going to get in the direct, uh, we're not going to get in the market of selling direct access but by providing infrastructure in the same way that we provide roads as infrastructure, it supports and facilitates economic growth um, and community access. Uh, one of the areas, just again to give you an example and see if we can make this come alive a little bit, is um, conversations around the, the use of small cell technology and the next generation of wireless technology, um, which is coming in the next you know, year or two or three, uh, all of those points in small cell towers will have to be connected back through fiber. So uh, as people consume 
more and more data, you know, people are watching Netflix on their phones, you know, uh, or whatever they're doing, they're consuming a lot of data and the carriers are looking to, to try and keep up. Um, so the, the growth of small cell and cellular technology will, uh, at its core, also require a, a fiber network to haul back to. So again, we're creating the infrastructure, if you will, for others to, uh, to, to bring new opportunities for, for residents. Uh, think of other things like telemedicine or um, other ways that, like, where you've got video in different places that you're trying to access. Uh, again, fiber is a, a great vehicle for that. So how do we go about doing this? Well, we've, again, showed you earlier the, the idea of starting with our police locations um, in the blue there, the phase one, pink there, phase two. And uh, then we started to map where are all of our fire stations, where, of, where are our public works assets, where are the other um, community centers, and populate that on a map. Uh, and then you can begin to look at and, and play around with, you know, what could a future uh, community network look like? How do you begin to connect up uh, places of, you know, where there are concentrations of uh, UG facilities? Uh, and how does that link up to economic development needs and sort of future, um, future development. So, in trying to create different layers in the, you know, in, in the puzzle, if you will, um, and so we've done a lot of the foundational work to understand, again, where our facilities are, uh, and to design, begin to design a network that could maximize the use of these public dollars. The other point here is that you know, as we're doing this, so are other communities. Um, so there are you know, a number of communities that are actively building out their own networks. And again, these are multi-use, um, multi-asset um, networks that are being built. And so as we think about the competition, it, we're, you know, it's not just that we're competing across the river uh, with you know, people that want to locate here. We're, we're really in a, a broader regional um, economy and you know the ability to have this asset and these assets is a you know it is advantageous to locating uh, new opportunities just to give you an example I spoke of Omaha this is the network they're building out so this is again not not conceptual uh, this is actually you know under construction uh, and is this is a you know a 10-year project so this is not like a you, know, you go in and you build it all out in year one, and Omaha has been working on this for a couple of years, but it gives you a sense of the types of interconnected rings that you can create over time and um, essentially light up new, new corridors. Uh, you can tie your sig traffic signals together and create a, a, you know, a more fluid or structured traffic uh, approach to traffic management and emergency response management. So again, a lot of these sort of benefits that we've talked about are able to be realized through the creation of a network like this. So the, the last point, uh, just to reemphasize, you know, think of fiber as, a, as infrastructure and as a strategic asset for the community that um, you know, we're paying for now, but will continue to accrue benefits you know, well into the future. Thank you. Mr. Bach? I think um, as commissioners have discussed a little bit during this presentation and, and as we look at this project, Two years ago, when we moved forward with body cameras, <clears throat> that was kind of a, a lot of momentum around it. It was one of those projects where it seemed like this is a thing we have to do within our community. Um, the chief and staff wisely, as we looked at it, analyzed it, determined we probably weren't quite ready for that at that time. There was a lot of unknowns just going through the whole policy discussions regarding when and where getting those procedures identified it give us we step back from this so I think at the time we came forward with this project we didn't come forward to say we don't think we should do it because I know we had or at least we believed the time the Commission the policy direction was we needed to move forward with such a project however we wanted to step up and say we're not ready for this we really need to spend a lot of time studying this understand it what I'm uh, extremely proud of where we've gone with this is just what's set up here. Body cameras really has become a component of what we're looking at to be a much bigger project. And it really jumps outside of the box and is very forward thinking about the future development of our community by recognizing where the fiber is. I, 
I can take this from a, a policy direction or whichever way you want to go with the body cameras. We can, we can make a decision that that's something we don't think is necessary within our police department operations. I don't, I don't have a chief that's standing on his desk saying he's got to have this or we can't, we can't move forward as a department. It is a useful tool and a component that will benefit our operations, but not one that we have to have. I do believe the fiber infrastructure is something that is very good and very beneficial for the future of our community. And, and even if you elected to say, well, let's stand down in this budget session and not move forward with the body cameras, I would push forward to say, let's move forward with the fiber aspect of this and still have ourselves in a position that we can utilize this if we went to the body cameras in the future or we elected to, well, as we are electing to do um, on the development side. And I will say this, uh, Mr. Connor and uh, Alan have both been working actively with the private sector because there are a lot of overlays, interactions that can be done with them that can also help defer some of our costs and also encourages them to bring in other private sector partners into our community. So um, I guess I just wanted to leave it with that. I went forward with this project. We never stopped from where we were a couple of years ago. We left that meeting with the direction that we're not ready to move forward. We were going to work on the fiber side of this equation and determine how that could come back in and then come back with a solution. And this is a solution we've built to come forward with. And whichever way you would like us to go, I, I'm open to that. Commissioner Kane and Commissioner Townsend. I'd be more apt to hire more officers than I would to, to go to the cameras at this point. Okay. Commissioner Townsend. I'm looking at uh, page 12 um, of the printout, and there's already been a discussion at the $1 million we see there for the fiber connectivity project would be split almost equally. Let's say we went forward with the connectivity piece for the public work aspect also, but as it's also only, let's just say we go that way. And later at some time, we say go for the body cameras, but with that 1 million that it would cost us now become 1 million 500 or something greater if we delayed the implementation because it was said that once you open um, to do the network, I mean, it would just be as easy to do it all at one time. Would that cost rise if we deferred doing both pieces, the connectivity for the other public works and the build out for the body cameras? Alan, Chief, you, Joe, do you guys have a feeling for the efficiency of yeah. how we're moving forward with everything together versus if we were to segment pieces out? I'd say that the, the like, likely scenario would be that the costs on the infrastructure costs around fiber would continue to rise because the, 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 uh, a lot of that cost goes when you open up the ground. So you know, those just like for regular you know, public works projects, you know, uh, we're, we're anticipating that those costs will continue to escalate through normal inflation. On the body cameras, it's a little more of a moving target. So this is a, a, a market that is rapidly sort of evolving, if you will. So you know, the camera makers and the companies that are in the space, uh, there's even, I think, just in the last year or so, there's been a lot of movement in there. So that one, is, it's harder to say with, you know, with a high degree of sort of certainty as to whether the price would go up or, in fact, the price might come down. Chief, I don't Well, I think that uh, just like the Wichita Eagle article pointed out with the uh, the increase in staffing that the district attorney's office needed in order to handle the body camera video. Mm -hmm. As time goes by, we might get a, at some point, we should have a real good idea of what does it take with personnel and equipment to be able to have a good body camera project. Mm -hmm. And uh, that article just came out, I think, about a month ago. And uh, it kind of took me back because those are some of the things that we never took into consideration mm -hmm. as far as personnel. I figured we needed two, but I never considered the district attorney. So I think there's still some cost associated with body cameras that are kind of unknown mm -hmm. and by waiting those things more and more of those will come to surface i think thank you chief and i was really talking about just the 
the network part of it. Might those increase? But you're right, there would be other costs. Just as you said, you need a, a person to be, for lack of a better term, the librarian uh, of all this uh, film that's going to be associated with that. One last question I have. People are so accustomed to being taped and filmed or on video. <coughs> and again, wondering about the chilling effect, if any, that this would have. About how large would these body cameras be? Would, would they be? Because I'm thinking people may not even be aware of them. The less aware of them, the less obtrusive they are. Uh, people may be less chilled by them. I, I think most of them are probably the size of this pager, most of them. Now they might come out with smaller ones. Sir, what is that you have in your hand? Uh, a pager. <laughs> a pager. Can we get some tech over here to identify that for us? <laughs> they're, about, they're about this big, but as time goes by, I'm sure that they'll start making them a lot smaller, but that's about where they're at now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Johnson. I want to talk about the pager. <laughs> <laughs> the pager's on camera. We can't remove it. I think in some context they call them a beeper. Your beeper. Oh, yep. That's right. That's old school right there. <laughs> I never had either one. So, you know, I, I do I, I do hear you, Commissioner Magia and Kane, you know, are we are we creating a problem that doesn't exist? You know, and I, I, I hear that. Um, I've talked to the chief about it. I've mm. sat back and I've thought about it. Um, talked to some other people, read some articles. Um, and I keep looking at my, my statistics while I know that one thing does not answer all of the problems that we face as a community. I do, I am still, I guess my gut still tells me, you know, all it takes is one time, one situation to occur, which then sways the mood of a community. Chief, you're doing a fabulous job. I, I have no complaints. Um, I think our community uh, policing groups, from what I hear from my neighborhood associations, it seems to be working great. Um, when there's any complaints, they'll call in and, and you know, and, and I think things are resolved relatively well. I think that's one of the reasons why we do have what is not, which doesn't get enough consideration in terms of the positive things that are happening in Wyandotte County, our community policing group, I think, helps to provide that glue uh, in, the com in the community. Um, but I keep thinking about this, this age of transparency. I really don't think that the, the need for body cameras is going to go away. I think um, when, when you have all these incidents, uh, people carrying these phones, and any time something goes down, they, they bring these phones out, and then what's reported is up to their discretion. I think that the body cameras helps to protect our police officers as well. Um, now we can't get all the information and it's already been brought up, you can't get every angle, but in just general discussion, you know, some angles are better than no angles. Um, and then I'm weighing the financial consideration, right? And I'm, I'm wondering if, if um, if, in terms of waiting, if we look at maybe doing a cost benefits analysis to look at things such as the cost of uh, the body cameras themselves and weigh that against the cost of litigation, maybe 10 years, looking back 10 years of, of what litigations might have been. And, I mean, I know it can become speculative in that regard. I, I, I think I understand that. but. Could, could that have mitigated some of the, the, the costs that we may have had to pay with regards to complaints or, or litigation? Maybe we could look at some type of cost benefits analysis. Maybe we need to hear from our constituency as well um, relative to that specific point of body-worn cameras. Um, I think we need to move forward with it, um, but I'm not opposed to measuring again before we uh, cut. Um, but I, I, do, I do think that as good of a job as, as, as you all are doing, I want to commend you, Doug. I want to commend you, Alan, and, all, and, and, and Chief, for all the work that you've done here. As good a job as we are doing in Wyandotte County, and I think that you're doing uh, leading our police department, all it takes is one situation for our 
mood to change. And I, 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 I'd rather be proactive knowing that we're moving towards a solution than reactive in that kind of situation. So thank you. Well, and I, I would chime in on that. The public has cameras, and I think our police ought to have them too. I mean, one of the reasons that our police have guns is because the public has guns. And so I think the public has cameras. We're seeing public camera usage um, of police interactions all over our country. The police having cameras also levels that playing field significantly and gives a second picture. Because I imagine there are going to be court cases coming where there's camera, a video on one side and a video on the other. And we've already seen it. You know, we've already seen the handheld camera by the public and the body-worn camera or the car camera by the police both being shown in the court of law. And I think having both of those, I think, I think video is ubiquitous. I think any public meeting that's not on video, people don't have any time for it. It needs to be on video because there's a record. People can go back and watch it if they want, even if they don't want to watch it live. Um, I think video is ubiquitous. I think it's not going away. And I don't think we've been reckless in this. I think we've studied this for two years. I think we've done the time to be smart about the infrastructure investment. I mean, I love seeing our thinking about economic development and community resource leveraging the cost of the infrastructure for the body cameras. I mean, I think that's exactly the high level of thinking that we expect of our government. I mean, that's terrific. Um, we've not been rushing into this. We've taken two years to look at it. Other communities have learned. We're learning best practices as we go. Um, I think our community expects it. I also know, um, and this commission knows, we've signed off on a number of um, settlements with um, police that, but for video, would have cost this organization millions and tens of millions of dollars, if not for the video that we had. We had a, our most recent case, we had seven million dollar request of liability against the unified government. And but for the video shown in court, those costs went away. And so these, um, the, the use of video in the court of law is, the, is not just the future, it's the last 10 years and are not doing everything we can to get in front of it. I don't want to have an incident in our community um, and, I, and folks say, well, we're the last community getting cameras. Why don't you have cameras yet is usually what I hear when I'm talking to people. I think it protects the public and I think it protects our police officers. Um, and I think that, that it's, um, it's past time. So I, I think the, maybe all the communities are gonna start getting rid of police cameras one day. Well, then we can get rid of ours too. But right now, I think the public expects it. I expect it. Um, and I think our officers deserve this equipment um, that's beneficial to, uh, to taking care of them and um, taking care of our citizens. So I want to see us move forward with it. And I don't think we've been overly aggressive. It would have been overly aggressive two years ago mm. if we'd bought those cameras with that grant without the infrastructure to back it. And that would have been kind of foolhardy, frankly. We have the, we're building the infrastructure, we have the protocols, we have the, the right chief and the right officers, let's give them the best equipment to do their job possible and let's get it, let's get it done in 2018. I think our community's waiting for it. Commissioner Bynum and then Walker. Thank you, I think a lot of those uh, were my comments as well. I, I um, reiterate that the public is making their own videos um, and we've seen that over and over again um, it seems like we would want our video as well to balance out how to tell that story I know in 2015 we the police department came in front of the standing committee basically with the DOJ grant to apply for the body worn cameras and we had a conversation about it, but we agreed for the grant application. And then when the application was received, we voted as a whole to turn it back. Um, and now in 2017, um, we've got yet another DOJ grant application pending. And, and I, mostly I'm just curious, would we turn that grant back yet again if we chose not to proceed? I'm, I'm leaning more toward keeping the body camera program 
uh, than uh, slowing it down or stopping it. Commissioner Walker. I, uh, I'm 100% for it. I was two years ago until you talked me out of it. <laughs> True. Um, you've all heard of the CSI effect that there is in court. The public has an expectation of certain kinds of evidence being available in every case, which is not realistic. Because despite what TV would have you believe, that evidence isn't always there. Same thing is true when you go into court and try to defend a case that does not have cameras. People are not unaware that there are departments, good defense lawyers as well as uh, civil litigation lawyers are going to point to the fact that we don't have cameras and we have a history here of discussing it and they're going to suggest the reason we don't want to do so is because we have something to hide. We don't want our officers because of their, however they choose to characterize our police department. I think we're going to be here if we don't do it this year or next year. We're going to inevitably be forced to do it. Um, and I know nobody wants to hear this, but this this step, if I understand this connectivity, I, I also believe that eventually, maybe not, certainly not while I'm on this commission, but inevitably you're going to you're going to tie in drone technology to this connectivity it's already being done all over the united states and it's a hell of a tool for the 360 degree view of a situation once you master the logistics of getting it to a location where there is an issue so i'm i'm all for it i think i think we we everything the mayor and Mr. Bynum, well, others have said is, is there's truth in all of it about the cost. And I, I'm not doing it because I think our police department uh, does bad things and I want to catch them. I, I want to do it to prove that when we're accused of doing bad things, our officers didn't do that. I had a long history here and I will tell you more than nine times out of 10 with the accusations made against police officers over my many years, there wasn't a grain of truth to it. And if we got an officer that's gone rogue on us, we need to know it and take steps to deal with it. So this comes up for a vote by the commission. I'm 100% for it. Well, it is currently in our budget um, as presented by the administrator, both for the fiber connectivity and for the police uh, body-worn cameras. So um, we are moving down that path unless this commission decides to take another direction. All right, I don't see any further comments on this. Thank you all for your presentation and for your hard work on this. Um, I believe we have one more item tonight, which is the 311. All right, thank you, Mayor. Um, the next item is not nearly as big an item in our budget. Actually, probably the bigger portion of the 311 project is the amount of staff time we are working to make this happen. Um, so we will give a status where we're at and how this is progressing with this year's budget. And I'll turn this over to Alan House to give this presentation. All right. This will be much shorter than the last one, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are, says hopefully. <laughs> uh, all right. So 311, uh, certainly an area of interest. Just <laughs> briefly, uh, not a lot of budget impact, but there is a, a request in the 2017 amended for an additional 58500 to complete the 311 uh, closed loop integration project, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. And 2018, there's, uh, again, a minor addition of operating costs associated with the expanded use of the CRM system, which is a good thing. So, you know, municipal court and others um, getting license access to be able to use this system. So 311, uh, year to date, just to give you a sense of the call volumes and where those, what those calls are about, uh, we're at about 60,000 calls here. Let's see if this works. Uh, my pointer, no. Uh, it's about 60,000 calls, so we're on track, you know, mid-year for about 120,000 calls. This is a. 
is it? Okay. So, oh, there we go. There we go. Um, so we're on track for a year-over-year -year increase from uh, 2016 in terms of the types of uh, in terms of the number of calls we're getting. Um, also of interest, we've been working closely with municipal court um, to help uh, increase the first call resolution for people who are calling there so they can get the information they need and they don't have to call back or they're not on hold as long. And we begin to see that reflected in municipal court numbers, went back and looked, and this has dropped uh, about three points from the 2016 full year total. So we're seeing a, a shift in the call mix um, as we've taken steps with the municipal court to uh, work with them on their, on their operations. Um, so again, using this uh, not only as a service tool to provide residents information, but also to use it as a management tool for, uh, for across the UG. So this is a little hard to read here, but just to give you a sense for the 311 closed loop project, what we're doing is linking together um, our 311 system with the Public Works Lucidity system here, which is how Public Works manages all their work orders. Um, and we're connecting that up uh, with our 311 app and our GIS application as well. So again, what do these lines on the, on the graph mean? It just means that we're building a lot of connections between a lot of different systems, which is essentially what we're doing with the closed loop 311. So that so many calls into the 311 contact center, they submit a request uh, to use the recent storm example for a tree down uh, or branch down. Uh, that information would get automatically routed um, to Public Works for action. So they'd have a queue in Public Works that they could take action on immediately. And when that was uh, completed and closed, it would then kick off a message back to the resident to let them know that that, in fact, had been done. Um, so this is, we're starting with Lucidity and Public Works. We're expanding this to the NRC uh, and things like code enforcement. And, you know, there are a number of uh, potential future applications that you can think of that integrate across systems. Uh, we're on target for, for this to be in Q3, um, and we have started piloting with municipal court as another example with this closed loop system where a call comes into 311. Um, if it is not a call that the 311 uh, CSR customer service rep can immediately answer, it's a more complicated inquiry, they will log that into the CRM system municipal court, uh, they will then pull that queue up um, downstairs and they will be able to re research the information they need to answer the constituent's question and then call them back when they have the answer. So the constituent doesn't have to sit on the phone for you know, a long time while the information is getting collected. So it's, again, a, a better customer service experience for people who are calling in. Uh, it's also allowing municipal court to be more efficient in how they respond to and collect the information for calls. Um, Give you another example uh, of how we're using 311 data. Just the the two back-to-back -back storms in June, we received uh, around 1,100, around 1,000 requests for debris pickup, and we use this as an opportunity to work closely with Public Works as well as with our GIS team um, to map where those calls came from. And we provided a file uh, on a daily basis to Public Works to say here are the calls that came in for debris pickup, um, and they were able to then uh, work against those and. I think got a, a good bit of positive feedback on the responsiveness and the speed at which uh, debris was picked up through the community. Interestingly enough, this is also of, of interest to emergency management, um, it, and it shows you that you can see through the intensity of the calls where the storm tracked through this, the community. So from the um, northwest corner, you can see how it tracked down through the community, and the calls sort of verify that. Um, not only is this just sort of, sort of interesting, and actually then think about, okay, where are you gonna first uh, put your public works crews? You put them where if there was the most intensive damage from the storm. So it allows us to, again, be more responsive and, and effective. And we're using this as, a, again, a learning opportunity for uh, working with emergency management and public works and public safety for how would we do this if it was a, another future event, another broader, larger scale event. I just want to also mention that part of our budget message was expanded GIS capabilities. So as we, as we, as we have events or as we have projects, expect to see more of this kind of uh, details coming from us. And these are the kind of things we think that will help in a lot of different ways, basically tell our story to help us be better responders and be more efficient. Mr. Walker, you had a I, I question. just have the, well, I, I see the data and we get a lot of calls. 
Um, do we have a uh, call satisfaction chart that shows how many times a person who calls 311 is satisfied with the response? I mean, uh, it used to be that if whoever wasn't picking up, it would refer it down to, th to Ben Blagg, who is our day-to-day -day guy. And Ben's a great guy. I mean, so I just, but that's not who I called. And are we still doing that? Are calls still being referred to 311 when whoever you're calling in whatever department doesn't choose to answer? What we're trying to communicate is that all calls originate to and through 311 so that it doesn't become the second call, it becomes the first call, and that gets then uh, logged in the, in, the, in the CRM system, customer relationship management system, and then is, can be act, acted upon by public works or others. Um, so we're, we're not there yet. I mean, just to, you know, this is a, uh, but this is going to take us a significant step in, in that you direction. Know, I, I I know you're a, a tech guy and I'm an old guy, but data for this data for the sake of data isn't worth anything if it doesn't result in a, a meaningful conclusion. You know, I'm sure we can identify how many people called for the June storm, but how many of those people got a satisfactory response to what they were calling about? Same with the BPU. You get a recorded phone number that, you know, your water's out, your light's out, whatever it might be. But in the end, how long did it take to get that, those lights turned back on? Or how long did it take us to fix the pothole? Or did we even fix the pothole? I think that's what he's talking about, if I could jump in with the integrated system and the ticket being created when someone calls in and then it goes through public works and then when it's complete they get a message back to the caller because that loop has not ever it's been an incoming line but we've not ever had that loop and we're creating the loop that's going to close that so that we can track the customer satisfaction and not just how many calls we took in but how many calls we resolved is that accurate it, that is, in fact. Well, yeah. Mayor, I hope so, because ever since we got 311, that was what we were supposed to be getting from day one when we replaced the old Action Center. We got more data out of the old Action Center than we ever got so far out of 311, and we've been paying the tax on it for years. So here's another step that's supposedly going to give us all the answers that we haven't been getting for years. And if I sound a little frustrated, it's, it seems like this 311 is a bottomless pit of more money and no results. So I'm hopeful that somebody, my successor, can pick up a, a chart and see that, you know, we satisfactorily answered 100% of the pothole complaints because I've never been able to get that. Commissioner Markley. <coughs> Uh, exactly what I was going to say is that that what this should resolve is what I get calls about where somebody says I called 311 three weeks ago and I'm looking at the NRC link and there's still nothing showing up on this property because somebody at 311 called somebody at NRC and told them to put it in the system but it isn't actually in the system yet and so the person thinks their call hasn't been received and they're saying what has happened to my call if we do this and everything is integrated, then the person on 311 should be able to enter the information into NRC link, right? And then it's gonna be there immediately. So when the person gets online, they're gonna see, look, somebody got my call and they put it in the system and now I can track it instead of calling 311, then waiting a couple weeks, then calling me and saying what happened. <laughs> and then I'm calling and saying what happened. Um, just, you know, should clean up that link a little bit so that people are feeling like they're getting a response. Commissioner McKiernan and then Margia. Well, and I'll just, I, so I was going to save this till the end, but I'll, I'll just uh, go with this now. So right now, I think what you've told me is we're on our way to this total closed loop system where we actually get feedback back on the problems we put in. So if somebody goes to 311.wicokck.org and they put a problem in there, then it, gets show, it shows up on this little map, right? So I've been known to turn in a code violation or two, and if I turn them in, 
do they show up on this little map? And I know the answer is no, because I can look at the map and tell you, no, they don't. And if a constituent calls 311, do those show up on this map? Or does this map only show what's been submitted through the web interface? It's the latter at this point. If I go back here, what we're, we're solving for that here so that regardless of where, and this is too fine a grain detail to see on a, on a slide, so apologize for that, but regardless of that's why we have multiple sources of entry for where that call comes in, because right now, while we're trying to move to a 311 as the first line of, of entry, we recognize that that is not, in fact, the case, and that calls could come in to, um, to multiple sources. And so if we want to have a, want to be able to track against those, we have to understand which calls have been received directly by NRC, in your example, uh, which ones were enter by staff at NRC, so not just an external call, uh, but people who are out there and they, they enter something into the NRC system, as well as 311 calls directly or web submission. So there's, it's a multi-channel environment. Um, well, and, and I'm trying to go around to all my neighborhoods yep. and say, don't call me anymore. We've got this great system. It's called 311. Call them. And then they call and they, like Commissioner Markley said, it's like, what happened? Yep. And so. I have to go to the old system, which was, hey, Emmerich, can you check on this for me, please? And I'd love a closed loop back to me that says, this issue, it's been fixed. And I don't have to call him and bug him again. Hey, what happened to this issue? Or I don't have to go out and search for it. I just get that loop closed myself. And I can tell you, as I look at this map, um, it's pretty, but it's not very useful. It's not very functional on this map. So if I hover over a little dot, that's not the map he's talking about. No, no, I'm not talking about that map. I'm talking about the 311.wicokck.org check on your status map. And so I put my little hand over the, the marker, and it pops up a little <laughs> balloon that says, hey, here's the address, and, and it says the status is completed. And I can tell you if that's not true, because that's a living, breathing code violation right there. Um, and it tells me the incident date, but it tells me no other data about this call. If I take the hand off and I try to put it on the balloon that popped up and said, here's all the information, the balloon goes away. So where do I as a citizen get to track this and find out what's the current status? So I as a citizen have to remember, I got to go out to NRC e-link on the other website I understand. and click in there and tap through a whole bunch right. of really difficult data input. Whereas the citizen wants to just go, oh, it's on a map. That's my street. Hover over that. Now I know. So I'm hoping that when you get all of these systems linked together, we'll actually have one system that will take all sources of input into one common database and one common reporting and one common feedback system, because that is what I think we're all looking for in this. And I understand there's a lot to build yet, but we're still really disconnected and siloed when it comes to our data and how we gather it and how we store it and how we report it and how we feed it back. So I'm hoping that's where we're headed. And if anyone wonders if the public's expectations are gonna go backwards on technology, the answer is no. Com Commissioner Merguia. Thanks, Mayor. So 40% of my um, constituents do not own a personal computer. Um, we haven't yet um, surveyed the number of my, or percentage of my constituents that own a smartphone, but I would guess that that's probably higher because people, if they want to have a job, they have to communicate. So I'm guessing on that. Um, this is uh, so those so Commissioner Markley and Commissioner McKiernan um, are, in my opinion, at least to me, the most technically savvy on our commission because I always resort to going to them when I can't figure anything out. And Hal um, Walker. <laughs> and Hal, I forgot about Hal. <laughs> so um, I'll tell you the map, I'll, I'll just confess, the map that Brian just turned around on his computer, I've, I've been up here over 10 years, I've never looked at it. Um, and I do handle those calls to my constituents because one, um, sometimes, not often, but sometimes I have a language barrier in my district and a lot of times I have an educational barrier and then my constituent has a computer barrier. <laughs> so um, there's all kinds of issues. So. I'm going to ask you a very elementary question. This is where I would like to see us go. Maybe this isn't taking us there. I don't care about what's in queue. I care about what gets done. 
Um, so I don't need to know that you heard me. I just need to know that it happened. So um, I'll give you an example. I want my constituents to be able to dial 311 and say there's a pothole at 24th and Strong or 39th and Rainbow, and um, they can call it in and receive a text that says done. Yep. That's all I wanted to say, done. And then if they go by and it's not done, then they can call me and then I can call you and say that technology's not working. <laughs> um, so if we're getting there, and I know that in the next couple slides in our packet, there's a phone picture here. So I hope that means that um, that's gonna be what happens. And then the other thing is that um, occasionally, once in a while, some of my constituents get a ticket in municipal court. Um, and so, like Commissioner Markley has said, they forget their court date or they need an extension because they typically can't afford an attorney because um, I have a lower income district. So they're trying to manage this themselves. Um, so if they're just calling, I notice the largest number of calls are for municipal court. Again, if the question is calling into 311 and saying, this is my name and I need to know when my court date is again, if there's a way to just text that back to them, um, that would be fantastic. So if we're headed in that direction, we are. I'm very happy. We are headed that direction. Are we, are we there or are we still moving in that direction? Can, can I go wait ahead. five minutes and yes, see, go ahead. see if that answers, answers your question? Because right. um, yes, and, and, and recognize, so you know, with the, if it had another month and I could come to you in a month and kind of show you where we are, I think, uh, and we will we'll come back and give you a broader presentation because I think we will have something to demonstrate here. Just uh, want to know that this is more than conceptual, that we have uh, the, we know what we're doing, we know what we need to do, and we've got the resources and the people in place to do it. Um, and so, you know, the, so we're uh, very shortly, I hate to, hate to say, you know, trust me, but we are getting there. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're there. We're getting there. We're very close. So um, in conjunction with this, so one of the channels, to your point, Commissioner, is, is on 311 in the mobile app. So um, this not only provides 24-7, 365 access, uh, it also uh, provides much cleaner data, frankly, for uh, for crews to work on or you know, for our CRM system. So somebody can take a picture, somebody can have the coordinates from where they're, they took that picture out over their phone. Um, so it, it just uh, it makes it simpler for everybody involved. Uh, and we see meeting residents where they are in their mobile devices. So your point about the, the connectivity in your district is, is one that, you know, that's a growing uh, method of, you know, everybody's got a, a connected device and that's how people expect to be able to access information and services. Uh, so what we're rolling out is a, is a 3 one app um, that will be personalized. Um, it will have, uh, and you just download it. I don't know if anybody has the K-Tags application on their phone, uh, but it's gonna be similar to that, where when you go for the first time, you log in, and I'll give you a, a fuller presentation of this when we're ready to launch it, but you log in, put your name and information in there. You can load in payment options there, either through ACH, in other words, direct debit from your account, or a credit card, uh, or you can have both, um, so, and it will remember that. Um, it will uh, also can provide reminders. So for example, once we get it connected up, uh, with municipal court so that when somebody you can remind them that you've got a court date coming up and if it's just that you need to pay in order to be able to resolve that here's the method in which you can pay so it's both 311 as well as a uh, mobile payment option so, so one little detail um, one thing we experienced with Google Fiber east of 635 is um, because of the high concentration of poverty and I know this because I help work on it, when they had that competition and you had to sign up in advance and you had to pay $10, I think we all remember that, most of the people east of 635 don't have a credit card. And so we worked around that and, and we figured that out. Um, so in this case, um, would if I call in and say, I got a traffic ticket for speeding and I want to be able to pay it, but I don't have a credit card, if I ask 311, can you give me, um, can you give me the address to City Hall, and can you tell me the floor I need to go to? Well, can they text them that? Will yeah, this system able, text them that? Should be able to. Yes. Okay. Thank tell you. Tell them where to go. And and again, part of this is you sort of think about it in the same way you think about traffic on a on a road, right? So once you hit a certain point, then everybody slows down. So if we can take a certain percentage of people that 
do have credit cards or do have other payment options and move them off to a different channel, it frees up more time and capacity to deal with people who are doing walk-ins and that sort of thing and just speeds the whole process up. Um, it will also uh, keep your transaction history in there and your receipts in there so it's, you know, again, no longer, you know, I can't find my receipt and that kind of thing. So we see it as having uh, multiple benefits. And just like dispatch, um, when someone calls in, will the system keep track of when they called in? Because someone might call me and say, nobody answered my call and I called a week ago. And would I be able to call you or someone up and say, when did this person call in? And would there be a record of when that person called in? There will be. There, the integration that's a, I want to say of next phase after we tie Lucidity together with our CRM system is to integrate the phones with the CRM system so that when somebody calls in, it is automatically picking up who they are, where their number, are they, do they have a previous call history? Um, just kind of like you expect when you call a commercial call center, right? They know who you are and they have your, your contact history in there. So yes. yes. I just think that that particularly is important because we noticed this with our calls for service to police is that, um, so a couple of calls, I'll give you an example that I'll get is, or complaints I'll hear at neighborhood groups is, well, the police were called and it took them 45 minutes to show up. Well, if you're making the call, it seems like 45 minutes, but really in reality, it might have been four minutes. You know, um, and so it's been very helpful to be able to go back and check that. And I can see that being an issue. If you drive over a pothole every day or over a bad road every single day, um, it might seem like it's your, you called a week ago, but it might have just been a couple days ago. So I think I'm only telling you that because as you put this technology together, um, that there's a very practical side to it on why we, we as commissioners and why the public might need that level of elementary service. Yep. And, th and there's two right. sides of the coin. So there's the customer service side uh, in providing excellent customer service that people expect. There's also the management side and how we manage our operations. So to your point, understanding when people called and what they called about, and then you know, was there, did they call back again two weeks later because either they had another question or it wasn't resolved. Mm -hmm. It gives us that information that we don't have right now to be able to go and, and look at. And sort of back to the storm map as mm -hmm. an example, um, while this time the crews did a, you know, a canvas of neighborhoods, mm -hmm. um, if, for example, we got a bunch of calls back in that said, hey, our, our neighborhood wasn't, you know, nobody ever came out, we'd be able to pick up that and, and on that and say, okay, well, we had this log of calls from this neighborhood that called, you know, the day after the storm and three weeks later, you know, we're getting calls about that neighborhood again. Okay. Um, and, and the good thing is we, through this work with Public Works, we haven't had that sort of second round of calls saying, hey, where are you? Um, and uh, you said you were going to come and you never did. Okay. All right. So we it's have a management tool. We have yep. two slides left. Keep going. We'll keep going. All right. So uh, we're uh, working with a company. That was subtle. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> A, uh, a company in Kansas City, Missouri called Pay It um, that will be our provider for this. And again, it will be an integrated app where you can pay uh, you know, personal property and real estate taxes. You can pay court and ticket fines. You can report 311 issues. You can get that notifications and information. Uh, we're looking at it September 15th for the initial 311 capability. Uh, and that's the first out of the gate is to be able to report an issue uh, through your phone. Uh, followed by mobile payment and real real estate and personal property, uh, and then followed again by municipal court and parking tickets. So there's a there's sort of a cadence that we're building into this to roll out new capabilities, and uh, we you know, we won't get it 100% right the first time we roll it out, but we're going to roll out the initial capability in September, and then we're going to continue to iterate on it um, and and build that out. And just to give you, this is again hard to read, but to get an example of a of a conversational interface. Commissioner, to your to your point earlier, um, this one would be, you know, what what are you here for? Um, what's your issue? Person writes in, you know, there's a dead animal on the road. The the chat bot essentially recognizes that and and says, are is this are you asking about a dead animal? Is that correct? And you can say yes, and then it can you put in your information or a picture or something like that, and then it will route it again appropriately to the right place. Um, so it, it's a it's not just a drop set of drop-down menus, but really trying to meet people where they are 
um, and, and how they interact you know, as people and not just as you know, person to machine. And then they'll get a text message saying it's been taken care of. They will, so we're looking at three. So one to say we received it, so we got it. It didn't just drop into the black hole somewhere. Second, you know, it would be if it's being worked over a period of time, they can go back and check that. And the third is just the closed status. Like it was acted on and it was closed. And again, that gives us additional information. So if it, somebody gets a, a message saying it was closed and in fact it was not actually you know, to their satisfaction, they can call back in and we can look at it again. All right, Commissioners Philbrook and Townsend. So it's so well coordinated, I know it is. I'm going to say that and put, it, put that out in the universe. Um, but uh, what are the possibilities of multiple people turning in something similar and ending up having multiple um, work orders put out? You know, and then everybody's kind of going, what, what? And then George and Sam show up, show up for the same job. Yep. That's... That's one of the things that's taken us a while to work through, and we, we've recognized that. So as an example, just to get back to the storm example, there was, uh, if you look on the list of calls, there was about 15 that came in rapid succession from somebody probably just sort of hitting submit on their, on their, um, through their computer, right? And so that's clearly you don't want to dispatch multiple trucks to, to the same location. Uh, and so we're working with Public Works on what does the queue look like for them? How do you recognize duplicates? How do you pull duplicates out? How do you consolidate? So, you know, to use a neighborhood example from the storm, if you know, you're all on the same street and you had multiple people from the same street calling in, you want to be able to respond individually to people so that they know that they engage, but you need to consolidate those. So there's sort of a, a many to one relationship and then once it's been closed, then you've got to go backwards, right? And so you've got one ticket was closed, and now it's got to come back out and notify many people. So there's, there's, a, there's a logic, internal logic that needs to be, that is being built out to, to satisfy this. And, and that's part of the complexity of it. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you. Uh, in addition to the simple statement in reply to uh, a request for action that it's been done, Will that also include the date of completion, which I think is important for that to be a part of the message too? Is that part of the current design? Uh, we had not taken to that, to that level of specificity in terms of what that message could be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Also, you know, we're, we're under discussions in terms of those interim, how, you know, how much interim messaging do you do with people to let them know the interim steps that are being worked? Mm -hmm. um, so we can go back and look at that. And I don't know that it, by September we would have that in phase one, but if that's something that you think people would want to see, then we can you know, look at it for a future. I think would be helpful uh, because that would be the natural question. It's done, when was it done? And I would think that would be information we'd have readily available. Thank you. Commissioner Markley. I was just going to comment on that, that reply back. I think <laughs> the easy ones are the ones where it's, a pothole and you fill it and it's done but we all know like you talked about the living breathing codes violation in those cases there's it, it's going to be difficult to send a text back that says that case is closed because it may not be closed for months years for a really long time it could just be an ongoing problem so in those cases i'll just say for my input i would like to have the staff member call the person and say this is the situation we don't know who owns that house the owner died 20 years ago we can't figure out <laughs> you know we're, we're trying to get a hold of the estate just walk the person through the process they're going to appreciate that way more than 20 interim text you know text notifications over a two-year period while we figure it out so there should be some level of complication where it just notifies a staff member and says give this person a call and fill them in on the situation so they know the details and those are some of the the business rules that we'll work through because you'll be able to see how tickets start to age out right and so are there ones that hang out there for 60 days or 90 days or 120 days and what's the reason for that there may be very good and legitimate reasons for that and that may be you know to, to the business rule side where that kicks off a call back to a, somebody who initiated it um, we're also putting in the ability for people to submit anonymously again recognizing that for codes violations you know in particular that you know people don't necessarily want to be associated with it but we wanted them to be able to continue to use the mobile app. Um, Commissioner Merguia? i just add on to what Commissioner Markley said, and, and if this would be possible, if um, so I, I have those same code violations. It can go on for years. 
Um, but if there is a way to classify those, so for example, if you call in a code violation for overgrown grass and it's resolved, a done would suffice. I mean, especially if it's done within the 30 day abatement period. But so I don't know how they feel, but a call doesn't, I wouldn't necessarily call on overgrown grass. Um, but if it's a, it's broken windows, f open door, roof caving in, um, you know, then that might warrant a call. Oh, there's multiple violations. <laughs> yeah, but I just, I would hate to have, a, we, we, you know, we already know across the county, we have a number of code violations all over, and I would hate to see our officers' time spent making phone calls to every code violation that was called in. So for efficiency purposes, if there was a way to, for you all to figure out how to do those 30 day and less things and say, even to send a message, that might be one since it takes so long that there is a message said, if this isn't done in 30 days, you'll be contacted, you know, whatever that threshold is. But it's just a suggestion, because then it also weeds out people calling us and getting it off track again. Right, and, and we'll, and this is a work in progress, so we'll continue to iterate and, and I think your feedback is really helpful in terms of the way that people are reaching out to you and the way that we can also recognize you all as essentially customers, right, of, of 311. So, you know, we didn't have it on that map, but, you know, on the storm calls, we've got a commission district layer. So you can see by district where those calls came in. We have that information and, and we can, you know, try and support your your needs and make it easier for you. So when you get those calls, you're able to respond or, or you know, tell the person that as, you know, um, I'm sure Emmerich would, Appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Well, a big step forward, this closing this loop on 311 is something we aspired to do almost 10 years ago. And so I appreciate your work on this. Um, this concludes this budget session. If you do have uh, next, this Thursday, we have a, uh, Doug, make sure I'm saying this right. This Thursday at 5 o'clock, we have a fire graduation. Yes, sir. And then at 6 o'clock, and that'll be at Memorial Hall, and then at 6 o'clock we'll be in here for our budget session. Um, and then the following Monday we have a public budget hearing at 5.30. Correct. Okay. Outstanding committee at 5 p.m., followed by the public session. Or oh. not followed by at 5.30. At 5.30 we will have the, um, the public hearing, and that will be in the chambers. So thank you all. If you do have topics for the um, budget sessions, please send them to my office or to Mr. Bach, and we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>